Hi, everyone, and welcome to Best Practices for Providing Legal Services and Legal Education in Prisons and Jails, co-sponsored by Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, Bay Area Legal Aid, Root and Rebrand, Her and the Harriet B. High Center for Family Law and the Legal Aid Association of California. My name is Jasmine, and I'm the Trainings and Communications Associate here at LAC. Today's session will be presented by Eva Dallaire from Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, Rachel Herger from Bay Area Legal Aid, Emily Juno from Root and Rebound, and Holly Leonard from Harriet Buhai Center for Family Law. Before we get started, I want to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, please call 877-582-7011. If you have any questions about this specific webinar, you can email me at trainings with an S at lacconline.org, L-A-A-C online.org, and I'll try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this call is muted, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send them using your chat box. This session will be recorded and materials will be posted online in the coming um, soon, so you'll have access to those things in the coming days. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Hello, and welcome to this webinar on the best practices for providing legal services and legal education to people in prisons and jails. We hope this will be useful for you if you've already started providing services to people who are currently incarcerated and if you're considering creating programs to serve those populations. I'm Eva Dallaire, a staff attorney at Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. We do not provide direct services. Instead, we primarily do advocacy and policy work towards the goal of returning incarcerated people to their communities, reuniting families, and restoring their full human and civil rights. And those efforts we've presented in prisons and jails about reentry, record clearance, and teach rec uh, family law classes in a few women's prisons in California. We're also a support center for legal aid organizations. If you'd like any technical support or further information about this topic or others related to this, please reach out to me after this webinar. But let's get started. With me, we have three different presenters, uh, each of whom use very different models to provide different services and legal information to incarcerated people. Let's start with a short introduction and, about, and a bit about each of your programs. Rachel, would you lead the way? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, perfect. Uh, let me see if I can get the presentation going uh, from the beginning. Perfect. Thank you. So as Eva said, I'm Rachel Herger. I'm a staff attorney in the SSI unit at Bay Area Legal Aid in the Alameda County office. Um, Bay Area Legal Aid or Bay Legal is the largest legal aid provider in Alameda, excuse me, in the Bay Area. And we provide free legal services to low income clients in a wide variety of practice areas. So SSI work is just one component of our legal services work. Before I get into the advocacy work, I wanted to give an overview of SSI and SSDI benefits for folks who may not be familiar with them. Um, so SSI and SSDI are both disability benefits programs administered by the Federal Social Security Administration. Both programs use the same standard for disability, a claimant has to show that they are unable to perform competitive full-time work due to a disability or a combination of disabilities. Uh, and these disabilities can be physical, mental, or a combination. And the disabling condition must have lasted or be expected to last at least 12 months or more. For SSI benefits, uh, claimants can also qualify if they're 65 or older. The main difference between SSI and SSDI are the financial eligibility criteria and how much you get in benefits. So SSI benefits are need-based, meaning that they're for individuals whose income and resources fall below certain thresholds. And SSI benefits pay a fixed monthly amount depending on the individual's living situation. Right now, the basic SSI monthly benefit amount is about $895, although that can vary up and down depending on living situation. SSDI benefits are a social insurance program like Social Security retirement benefits, 
meaning that claimants have to have worked and paid into the system for a certain amount of time in order to qualify and must become disabled within a certain time period after they stop working. Like retirement benefits, um, someone can also qualify based on the work and earnings history of a spouse or parent. So sometimes we're representing, for example, children who may qualify for benefits based on their parents' work record. And SSDI benefits pay uh, a monthly amount that can vary based on your earnings history. Claimants can be eligible for both types of benefits if they have both enough work history for SSDI benefits and they also fall below the income and resource thresholds for SSI. Uh, the majority of our clients at Bay Legal qualify for SSI benefits. Um, many of them don't have sufficient work or earnings history to qualify for SSDI. And this is especially true for the clients whom we work with at Santa Rita Jail and clients with histories of incarceration who may not have had much or any opportunity to work. So our SSI and SSDI advocacy program is a countywide program in Alameda County specifically to provide legal advocacy and representation to clients seeking SSI or SSDI disability benefits. The program is funded by Alameda County itself and also includes a number of other service providers who are funded by the county to provide relevant services. So at Bay Area Legal Aid, we have 20 attorneys providing SSI representation in Alameda County. Homeless Action Center, which is another legal service provider, has another 60 attorneys in Alameda County doing the same work. Um, and in addition to legal services, the county has also funded case management services and medical clinics that focus on reentering and homeless individuals. And these are all part of a countywide collaborative program. Our attorneys provide full representation at all stages of an SSI claim from the initial application through federal, federal, appeal, federal court appeals if necessary. We focus on clients with mental health impairments, although many of our clients also have physical impairments as well. And the majority of our clients are referred to us by county affiliated behavioral and mental health care providers. We also serve clients on general assistance and or walk-in clients or callers who have mental or physical impairments. Um, and for today's discussion, one of the key county affiliated mental health providers who refers clients to us um, is the mental health provider at, at the Alameda County Jail called Santa Rita. And in addition to working on clients SSI cases, we also work hard to try to connect clients with other support services, including case management, medical and mental health care and other support services to try to help clients um, achieve stability, both financial and living throughout the process of their SSI claim, which can be a lengthy process. Within our broader SSI advocacy program, we specifically work with and take on SSI cases for clients at Santa Rita Jail. Um, so as I said, Santa Rita is the main county jail for Alameda County, and the mental health service provider there is called Criminal Justice Mental Health Services, or CJMH. Clients are generally referred to us by CJMH as they identify individuals who are receiving mental health services who may be in need of SSI benefits based on their mental health conditions. We also get letters from individuals at Santa Rita who are reaching out to us for assistance with an SSI case, and we generally screen those for eligibility and then meet with them if they seem to qualify for our services. We have a group of five or six attorneys who are cleared to go into Santa Rita jail, which we do on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to meet with both new referrals and ongoing clients. Um, and I'll just note that Homeless Action Center also has a team of attorneys who work with clients at Santa Rita. In an initial intake meeting, we will meet with new referrals, we'll explain SSI and SSDI benefits and give them an overview of the application process. We'll find out if a client may be interested in applying for benefits and getting representation. And if so, we can complete an application with the client on the spot during that initial meeting. If clients already have an existing or a pending case or an appeal, we can take on their case at whatever stage it may be at. 
And in many cases, this requires some investigation after the visit in order to figure out what's happening with the client's case currently or what has happened since the client became incarcerated. Some of the clients we meet with were previously on SSI or SSDI benefits before their incarceration, and their benefits have been suspended while they are in jail. In these cases, we generally provide more limited information and advice about how clients can restart their benefits after release. Um, and just a note for clients who are receiving SSI benefits, again, that's the need-based income, their benefits will be suspended once they're incarcerated for 30 days or more, um, but they can be restarted if the client is released within 12 months. If the client is incarcerated for more than 12 months, unfortunately, benefits are terminated and the client has to reapply from the beginning, which is something that we'll help them do. For clients who are receiving SSDI benefits, the work-based benefits, um, these are more generous and can generally be re restarted after release, regardless how of how long the client may be incarcerated. So I just worked with a client whose benefits had been stopped um, back in the early 2000s, and we were able to get them started and get him the back pay that had accrued previously, um, as well as restarting his benefits going forward. We often go back to Santa Rita to meet with ongoing clients later in the case, depending on what stage it's at. So we may go back to complete additional questionnaires and paperwork, complete appeals if clients' cases get denied. If a client's case is at hearing, we may do hearing prep with them. And in some cases, we've even done administrative hearings with clients while they're incarcerated by telephone. Once a client is released, we'll continue to represent them in their SSI claim once they're back in the community, and then we'll also work to connect them with supportive services in the community. Um, and the last part, connecting with supportive services, is especially important for our clients coming out of Santa Rita, um, since many of them don't have strong or sometimes any community support systems, um, and many of them have very little treatment in the community prior to Santa Rita or outside of periods of, of incarceration. So connecting them with support services like medical and mental health care, case management support, and housing support is especially important. So why is pre-release SSI advocacy important? Um, SSI benefits are particularly important for people in prison and jail, and it can be really important to start the process early prior to release. Uh, as many of you may know, there's a disturbingly high percentage of people in prisons and jails who have mental and or physical disabilities. And statistics generally show that the percentage of in individuals with mental health conditions is even higher in county jails than in state prison. A lot of our clients, as I said, have really limited histories of medical or mental health care outside of prison or jail. Uh, and many of them have either previously been on disability benefits at some point in their life or have a very strong need for them. The other thing about the SSI application process is that it can be a long one. Um, depending on appeals, it can take several years for a claim to get approved. So we generally try to meet with clients who are within four to six months of release or have some identifiable release date. Our goal is always to start an application so that it will be approved by the time the client is released. And while this doesn't always happen, um, it's really beneficial to start the process before clients are released, um, both to get a jump on it and get things advanced, but in the hopes that benefits will be available as soon as possible after a client is released. And Social Security's own rules specifically allow people to submit applications prior to release from prison or jail. Um, and I'll just note that without SSI benefits, you know, clients are often released with no stable source of income, no connection to medical or mental health care, no access to housing, and this exacerbates the reentry challenges that clients face across the, you know, across the spectrum um, and can really exacerbate issues like homelessness, lack of treatment, and a higher risk of reincarceration. SSI and SSDI benefits are also incredible to low-income clients in general, regardless of their incarceration history. 
they are a stable source of income and are generally much more valuable than general assistance or general relief, which is the county level cash assistance that clients often get otherwise. Um, as I said, the base monthly benefit right now for SSI is just under $900, whereas general assistance may only be a couple hundred dollars every month. SSI and SSDI benefits are also linked to health insurance. So if you're on SSI, you can automatically link to Medi-Cal. If you're on SSDI, you can automatically link to Medicare. And that helps stabilize clients' access to treatment and overall well-being for their impairments. Benefits are also linked to other types of supportive services, including in-home supportive services, vocational rehabilitation, work incentives. And so helping clients to stabilize their income and their health care really improves well-beings overall, improves successful re-entries for clients coming home from, re sorry, from incarceration, um, and in some cases can enable an eventual return to work. One thing that's notable about our advocacy program here in Alameda County is that the county tracks data and outcomes for clients served through us and our partner organizations work. The numbers up here include both clients from Santa Rita Jail and throughout the county. So of 720 clients who were approved for SSI benefits, nearly 80% experience fewer psychiatric emergencies, 80% experience fewer psychiatric inpatient stays, and 70% experience fewer incarcerations. So ultimately, this produces um, you know, significant long, this greatly improves the well-being of our clients in the long term. Um, and it also produces significant savings for the county in the long run, which I'll talk more about later. Um, as I said, there are two legal service providers in Alameda County. So for those of you who would like to refer clients in Alameda County for services, uh, I think the PowerPoint will go out later and you can connect them with Bay Legal or Homeless Action Center. I'm gonna pause for now and turn things over to Holly Leonard from the Harriet Buhai Center. Um, and it, that's everything for now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I'm hoping you can. Um, my name is Holly Leonard. I'm a staff attorney at the Harriet Buhai Center for Family Law. The Buhai Center um, is located in Southern California. Of everybody speaking today, I'm the only one that's in Los Angeles County, home of the losing Los Angeles Dodgers. Let me tell you a little bit about the center. The center was established in 1982 by the Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles and the Black Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles, the goal being to give assistance uh, for free to low-income individuals in Los Angeles County. We are a nonprofit, and in addition to helping clients with their family law cases, we also, uh, we also teach classes at two of the jails located in Los Angeles County. CRDS, which stands for Century Regional Detention Facility, and the Twin Towers. We only teach to women. CRDF is only for women. And Twin Towers has both men and female, in, male and female inmates, and we teach to the female. In addition, we are the only nonprofit, either in Southern California or perhaps in all of California, that will take cases where there are houses and pensions at issue. Most nonprofits will not. Our average client um, is a probably a 40-year-old single mother. She may be a high school graduate, uh, but she may only have a sixth grade education and has at least one child and is receiving some type of government assistance. 65% of our clients uh, report that there is domestic violence in their relationships. 60% of our clients identify as Hispanic. 18% of our clients identify as African-American. 14% of our clients identify as Caucasian. A total of uh, 57 to 60% of our clients are receiving either CalWORKs, SSI, Social Security, or State Disability as their only form of income, and about 14% of our clients have no income whatsoever. And the majority fall below the, fed the, the federal poverty guidelines. Okay. 
Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, our project that we at the jail where we teach. Our program is designed to help women to make more informed decisions relating to their family law, their welfare, their safety, their security. Uh, the majority of the women that we teach have told us they never knew anything that we tell them about their cases. Uh, since July of 2016 through this last June, we had 3,200 attendees, but the program actually started in 2006, and it went from 2006 until 2011. And at that time, we had served uh, over 20,000 inmates with our classes. We restarted the classes in 2014, and since 2014, we've had over 9,000 students. Um, I'm going to tell you about the three classes we teach, and then I will go into more detail in a moment. Uh, we teach three classes, one each day uh, of the week, and we teach, the first one is on dependency court, the second one is on domestic violence and restraining orders, and the third is on parentage and child support. Each class lasts approximately 90 minutes. For every class that an inmate attends, they receive a certificate with their name on it stating that they attended uh, the class. If they attend all three of the classes we give, they will also get a fourth certificate that has a gold seal and says that they took the entire program. Uh, these are, not only do the inmates feel proud of themselves for getting it, but these uh, certificates can be very effective in court. They take them to court and they show the judge what they have been doing. We, we encourage them to ask questions and to participate. They are given, for each class, they're given a workbook, which has fill in the blanks that we go over with them. The classes are all taught in English. However, every staff attorney that goes to teach has a client assistant with them that speaks Spanish, and we do have the paperwork we give out. We also have that in Spanish, but the class itself is taught in English. We also, in every class, give them different referrals for different types of services, and I'll go into that in a moment. Okay, so the first class is dependency court. Uh, where it says DCFS here, in Los Angeles County, our Child Family Services uh, Office is called DCFS, the Department of Child Family Services. I know it's called other things in other counties. We talked to the, the ladies about how the cases are reported to DCFS and how there are mandatory reporters that must, must uh, report even if they don't want to. We talk about abuse and neglect and we give them examples because a lot of people think that abuse and neglect may be only physical, but there's a lot of different types of abuse and neglect. Uh, we just we show them examples of getting uh, the best interests of the child should be paramount. Uh, that would include getting out of a domestic violence relationship, um, communicating with the child, love and affection for the child, taking care of all the child's needs, things like that. We discuss the stages of a dependency court case, what happens at the first hearing when a child has, they have to determine during the course of the trial or the case where they're going to house this child. We talk about the limits on reunification and case plans and that if they do not fulfill the reunification services within a specific amount of time, a permanent plan will be given by the court and it will not include that, that person as a parent. We also talk about the fact that you can modify an order of the dependency court in the future. You, you have to prove at that point, we tell them, not only the best interests of the child, but you have to also make a showing that there has been a significant change in circumstances such that the court should modify the order. We give them referrals at this class to the, a big family law referral list that has, a, we're on it, but many, many pages of different uh, areas, different offices in LA County they can go to. We also give them a fill in the blank letter that they can sent to the Department of Child Family Services, asking questions, even to find out who their caseworker is. And we give them a form that they can give to somebody uh, if they want a family member to be taking care of their child while the dependency court case is going on, but that family member has a prior conviction, we give them um, a form where they can try to go and get an exemption 
from that so that the person will be able to take care of the child. Our second class is domestic violence and restraining orders. Uh, we talk at length about the different types of um, domestic violence. It isn't just physical, there's financial, there's verbal, there's control, stalking, cyber stalking, um, all different types of domestic violence and they all count as that. We um, also talk about the effect of domestic violence on children. Um, a lot of times uh, people don't think it's going to affect the children because the children are young or the children are asleep or they're not home or whatever and we explain to them that the children it always has an effect on them. We give them true and false questions that they answer out loud about domestic violence and we discuss at length the barriers to leaving an abusive relationship, the, you know, the cycle of abuse. We talk about, a lot of them say, well, they don't want to leave because of their children and we explain to them that children are the reason you do leave a domestic violence relationship um, it, because you're just going to continue the cycle and in addition if you have a case in dependency court they're not going to allow you to have your children if you're still in that relationship. We then talk about restraining orders, the different types. We talk about uh, the emergency protective order which is for a very short time in order to, enabling you to go and get a domestic violence restraining order at court. We talk about criminal protective orders, which can only be issued if the criminal case is filed against the batterer. And we also, the main topic is the domestic violence restraining order. We also explain to them, even if you have a criminal protective order, you should always get a domestic violence restraining order in addition because it is the only type of order that can be renewed. The uh, criminal protective order, when it expires, it's done. And uh, being able to renew a domestic violence restraining order is really, really important. You do not have to show any further acts of domestic violence. And in addition, it can be uh, renewed for five years or it can even be renewed permanently. We talk to them about uh, the procedure for getting a domestic violence restraining order. That you go to the courthouse, we give them the list where that they, every courthouse has a domestic violence office and that we go through the procedure of filling out the forms and writing a declaration and that they get a temporary restraining order at that time. We then, we also discuss about what personal service means, that it actually has to be personally served on the individual and it cannot be served by the person that is requesting the restraining order. We go into discussions about what you should do if there is a restraining order protecting you, how you notify everybody, what you do if somebody violates it, and we also talk about what happens if somebody has a restraining order against them, against you, and um, the fact that only you can violate it. The, the person who has the restraining order can't. We give them referrals to the different courthouse clinics, to different domestic violence shelters and family service providers. We also give them a safety plan, and it's a fill-in-the-blank plan. Um, nowadays with cell phones, nobody knows anybody's phone number, anybody's address, that we don't know it, it's all in our phone. And we explain to them that, you know, when you leave a, a bad relationship or get out, you don't always have your cell phone with you. You either don't have it or it's been thrown or it's been stepped on. So that you need to have a list that you give to somebody that you trust that just has all the phone numbers, the children's doctor, the children's school, um, the address of anything you need, even your own parents' or friends' phone numbers because you won't remember them. Trying to click to the. Okay. I skip. Oh, okay. The third class we teach is on parentage and child support. We talk to them about why it is important to establish parentage, that that other parent would have custody and visitation rights, but would also have child support obligations. Uh, a child might be able, would be able to inherit from a parent that's the legal parent. We talk about the different methods of establishing who the other parent is. Uh, we go through the married rule, because it's one rule if you're married when you have a child. And then we go through the VDP, which stands for Voluntary Declaration of Paternity. And that is when uh, both the, the birth mother and whomever is the father signs a, a form saying that he's the father. 
and his name will then be put on the birth certificate, how much time you have to get your name off of a birth certificate, you have up until the child turns two. We also talk about uh, Family Code Section 7611D, which is called, uh, we call the Step Up Parent Section. This is a section where somebody who has um, been acting as the parent of the child, the other parent, and it can be same-sex or not same-sex relationships, can file in court and ask to be declared to be the, the legal parent of the child. We talk about child support, we talk about who pays the child support, how that's determined, and who receives it, what counts as uh, income for purposes of child support. For example, CalWORKs, uh, SSI, general relief, they do not count that as income for purposes of determining how much the support order should be. We talk about the consequences for failing to pay the child support. We also talk about if you're incarcerated, what goes on there. If a person is incarcerated for 90 days or more, their obligation to pay child support is told. Uh, they don't have to pay it. And supposedly since January of 2016, um, Child Support Services Department automatically gets notifications by way of computer um, telling them that somebody's in custody. However, we're not sure that always works, so we um, tell the other people we teach that they shouldn't rely on that and they should, we can give them a fill in the blank letter to the Child Support Services Department where they can notify them or they can notify them when they get out so that they can go through and see and, and change the child support order if they were in for over 90 days. Uh, we refer them and we give them a booklet to the family law facilitator, which is in every courthouse and all they do is child support. And we encourage them to talk to them because the family law facilitator can help set up a payment plan for somebody so that they don't have this huge debt every minute. They can say you pay this much every week they also have a debt forgiveness program. And I have heard from uh, women that have been in the jail that that has been very effective and they've had quite a bit of money um, forgiven on their debt to make it easier for them to pay it off. We give them a re-entry referral list. We give them information about all the offices where the child support services departments are. And we do give them that notice of incarceration. And we also give them a notice of, of handout of when they get out, how they can try to expunge uh, their record. Uh, as far as the challenges, sometimes it's the time constraints. We only have 90 minutes and sometimes we don't get them. They don't, uh, they're not able to get out of their modules to give us enough time. Uh, we have the learning. It's in Twin Towers, for example, it's a very informal setting where we teach. So there is always, you can hear loudspeakers, there's people going in and out. Um, you're not teaching in a classroom. Uh, last week there was a lockdown when I was there, so we weren't able to teach. Uh, it might be laundry day, that type of thing. Also, like everywhere else, the uh, women we teach have different levels of ability. Um, some speak other languages, some have learning disabilities, some have mental health issues or substance abuse problems. Uh, we don't give any individualized advice, and that's very hard on a lot of the women. They come in and they want to talk about the specifics of their case, and we are not allowed to do that. As part of our contract, we can give general advice, but we can't talk to them about the specifics of their case and tell them what their outcome could be. Also, it's very, very emotional. Um, a lot of these women have either given up or have had their parental rights terminated. And that's very, very difficult for them to talk about. It's difficult sometimes for them to talk about the domestic violence. And in addition, when we teach all the classes, we basically tell them that we're here to tell them about how the system is supposed to work. But we're very well aware it doesn't always work that way in the real world. And uh, that's unfortunate. I did not put um, our phone number or, our e or, the e or my email address on this PowerPoint. If any of you would like it, I would be happy to give it to you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Hello. Uh, I'm just going to get set up here. My name is Emily Juno. I am a staff attorney at Root and Rebound. Um, let's see if we can get the slides up. And I'm just going to talk briefly about our model. Um, we do work for people in prison and jail. Our general um, 
Our, our model is to provide uh, information about people's legal rights to people with criminal records and everyone around them who supports them. So as part of that, we reach out to people who are currently incarcerated either in jail or prison. Um, we have some programs uh, at various facilities, and I'm just going to go briefly through uh, what our work is. So we do know that education is a is a key fact or a key factor in whether somebody uh, ends up back in the system. Um, it helps with job readiness and increased earning potential. It um, people who are incarcerated who participate in some kind of education program are 43 percent less likely to end back up uh, in prison. 13 percent more likely to find employment. So this has been proven to be a factor for all different types of education. It doesn't have to specifically be workforce development education. Um, this has been found consistent through things like family um, family rights education, uh, certificate certification programs, and other programs that may not be specifically for finding employment, but are just generally um, stimulating and create uh, encourage confidence and uh, facility through the court system. So our mission is to increase access to justice and opportunity for people in reentry from prison and jail and to educate and empower those who support them, fundamentally advancing and strengthening the reentry infrastructure across the state of California. Uh, that's a little bit of jargon, but um, I think you've all got that. Um, so educate, uh, we do that by uh, having three key programs, one of which is to educate, and our flagship program is to create the Roadmap to Reentry, which you might have seen in the past. It's this big 1,200-page phone book-looking thing that covers all of the legal rights and information that somebody with a criminal record might need to know in plain and easy language. We also produce toolkits for various interest groups. Um, we have toolkits to help prepare people within the six months before release and to prepare their family members for release. Um, and we do, uh, we're coming out with a higher education toolkit, a toolkit for seeking an occupational license. We have uh, toolkits for employers. Um, we're trying to strengthen all uh, areas of infrastructure. We also do community training. Um, including many trainings inside prisons and 20-week program, which I'll talk about in a moment. We also do advocacy, and the this is one of our primary ways for providing legal services for people in prison and jail. Through our reentry legal hotline, we have received up to 120 calls uh, every Friday or on Fridays. Um, and these this hotline is available to people who are currently incarcerated because we have a GTL account that takes their calls. Um, we also occasionally take those calls outside of Fridays, depending on what the situation is. So we take uh, we take calls, and many of them are people looking for resources, and many of them are people looking to get basic um, basic access to identification. We're currently moving more into providing uh, support to family members who are trying to get visitation or custody of their children when they're released, or even more urgently, who are uh, who have impending here for termination of their parental rights and don't know what's going on and don't know how they can advocate for themselves in that situation. For, um, for people who want to discuss more confidential issues, particularly, um, this is particularly utilized by people on the sex offender registry, uh, we receive mail from prisons and we receive about 500 letters a week. Most of them request uh, social services, so we have a small database of social services in the major counties. and. Um, Many are also requesting those basic access to identification and family law issues. We also are expanding into uh, providing legal clinics in the communities. Um, the main community that we have focused on doing our legal clinics with have been either in the prison where we're doing a 20-week program or on tribal reservations. And then we also work on policy reform and systems change. So that's a lot. Um, but we've kind of gone through that. One of the things that we include in our resources is a sample reentry plan. So this is meant to be used either by a loved one who is not currently incarcerated or by an incarcerated uh, person in conjunction with their loved one. So this is kind of creating a plan for when someone is released. And that is one of the main things we hear is that someone is coming upon release and they don't even know where to begin. They have to get their um, ID, they have to find housing, 
They have to put together sometimes a parole plan for the parole board. They have to get together any certificates or diplomas they might have earned and they have to find employment. And all of this is kind of happening at the same time. So having just a attack plan has proven to be really helpful for people. So one of the, um, one of the major issues that people run into is that correctional counselors are overburdened or sometimes apathetic and people ask for forms for example a form to uh, authorize a representative to uh, advocate for them on behalf of social security um, or to pick up checks from the court for refunds and they can't get the form for six months by then they may have already been released they may have been transferred or the correctional counselor may have just forgotten about it so access to things like forms um, to uh, call the court system if you are incarcerated it is incredibly difficult to call the court system court system because gtl does not um, cover any system with a phone tree which means that you can't just call up the social security administration you can't just call up the court um, you have to communicate via, via letter for everything, and there have been some really disturbing practices, especially in jails, regarding charging indigent people for stamps. So, um, we one of our major programs is that we do trainings. Uh, these trainings uh, are usually one at a time uh, for one day uh, between three to six hours, and they're supposed to to cover people's rights when it comes to criminal records. The trainings that we do inside of prisons and jails tend to be focused much more on starting work on those re-entry plans. And we currently have a contract with CDCR um, to run a program at California Correction Center in Susanville, uh, which is about two hours north of Reno next to High Desert. Uh, it's a 20-week plan. We do six in-person lectures. We have seven lectures that are administered via DVD, and then we have seven more just workshop classes where our navigators, our um, uh, mentors inside the program, will help other students complete their homework and do quizzes and otherwise um, buff up their knowledge on their legal rights and create their re-entry plans. Um, we provide the roadmap guide to people. Uh, a lot of the program is based around navigating the guide and utilizing the information in the guide. We also provide the family and children toolkit and a re-entry workbook. And then we do individual consultations because as, um, as Rachel and Holly said, there is a need for more wraparound services. Uh, we provide consultations through survey. So we survey individuals and see what their uh, major needs are and then uh, prepare a packet for them with uh, referrals that they are eligible for housing, um, information on where their court order debt is, uh, any forms that they might need to apply for um, any forms that they might need to apply for identification or benefits. Uh, we try to get that to them before they're released. And this is just a, a clip of our workbook. There are um, it's going to need to be updated now that there's a new ban the box uh, rule, but there. Uh, it, the purpose of the workbook is to really get um, really get someone familiar with what their rights will be so that they can identify when um, first where to go when they need something and secondly to prevent legal crises from happening. We believe that uh, preventative measures can really help people from getting to those worst case scenarios where suddenly you know you're moving in with a loved one and it turns out that you know you can't live there because of public housing and then everyone loses their housing or um, something that you lied about in a job application shows up on a background check and then you no longer have employment. So we believe that um, providing just preventative measures can help people when they are in re-entry to prevent crises. And let's see, I think we're, okay. So that's the, that's the end of just my presentation. So I think we can move on to the questions at this point. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Um, so those were very different services and information all being provided in uh, prisons and jails. Have you three found any benefits in providing these services in the jail setting rather than the community? And please think about this expansively, benefits to clients, the community, uh, to your organization or to organizational efficiency, um, any benefits. Rachel, would you start? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think I, in my presentation, I went over what some of the real, why SSI benefits and why starting 
the process early is particularly important to people coming out of prison and jail, um, just because of the high incidence in jail of people with ment mental and physical disabilities um, and the importance of starting what can be a very long application process early. Um, I think the other benefit, sorry, let me open this up. Um, the other benefit, again, is that we try to connect clients with wraparound services when they're coming home. And that's important both for clients' well-being, um, but it also increases the likelihood of a successful SSI case um, when clients can be stable, can have access to treatment. It enables them to be able to participate in their cases um, in a much more engaged way. It helps us to stay in touch with them. Um, and it helps us to gather the evidence that we need for their cases. Um, so those are all reasons why providing services in prison and jail for SSI benefits, I think, is really important. And then, of course, all the reasons that SSI benefits are important when they get out in terms of helping clients to access um, a stable source of income, linkage to health insurance, and other supportive services. And for folks in reentry, again, this um, a lot of these income, housing, medical care, continuing medical care are a lot of the barriers to reentry that they face, particularly folks with mental health impairments or medical impairments that may have create additional functional barriers in the community that exacerbate all of the existing reentry barriers. So those are some of the reasons why starting this work while people are still incarcerated is really important. Um, again, it's important to note that we have to do this when there is a somewhat foreseeable release date. Um, again, SSI benefits will terminate if you're incarcerated for a year or more, so it doesn't make sense to start the process much earlier. Um, but this is the reason that the Social Security Administration specifically allows for pre-release applications um, and creates a process where prison and jail facilities can actually um, establish pre-release agreements with the local Social Security office in order to facilitate individuals who are at that facility starting the application process earlier. And that's something that's really important to our ability to provide these services to ensure that clients applications aren't incorrectly rejected um, and are processed correctly um, and to create sort of more collaborative linkages throughout the process. Holly, do you have anything um, to add? No, I can just tell you from my experience with the teaching the women in there, um, a lot of them have no kind of game plan for when they get out. They, a lot of them think that their rights have been terminated as a parent, and they don't know what to do to get those rights back. And we explained to them that in, other than in cases of adoption, most likely uh, their parental rights have not been terminated, and they can do things to show a change in circumstance that will give them more time or access to their child. They also, uh, they don't know of any of these places to go to. So I think our talking about that, our telling them about uh, places they can go or pre preparation for uh, if they're in a domestic violence relationship, getting prepared to get out of it has been extremely helpful to them. And Emily, would you add anything? Yes, so um, one, of, one of the things that we found, especially through the 20-week program, is that when we began, we did surveys to see what people's needs were. And at the end of the program, we had heard many of the students come forward and say, okay, I have my birth certificate now, or I have my social security number now, um, I have housing lined up. Um, I know a, a lot of people had already requested uh, court hearings uh, once they were released for uh, for modification of their uh, court order debt. So already having those in place means that's one less thing that they have to do when they're released. Um, we have not uh, followed up with any of the people who have been released yet, but we hope to uh, in the future. As far as we know, none of the people who have been uh, released from this program are back in the inmate locator system, which means hopefully that they are not going to um, end up back there again. 
So we have, we do believe that it's um, just an important part of easing the reentry process uh, and that getting people, getting to people before they're released is a valuable way of making sure that they don't fall through the cracks afterwards. If they have everything done that they can get done while they're still incarcerated, then that takes off uh, some of the enormous burden that people face when they're released. Thanks. And um, we are running a little tight on time. I have two more questions, but if audience members have specific questions, please type them in and we will definitely include them. And I think we can go over a little bit if we need to. Um, my next question is, I imagine there are some best practices and techniques you've learned uh, in order to better serve this particular population, which are different from serving folks in the community. Can you talk about those? And Holly, you had kind of already mentioned uh, the importance of providing certificates. And Emily, I heard you mention that you kind of have a train the trainers model within the prison. Um, are there other things or would you like to talk a little bit more about that? And again, I'm going to have Rachel start. Sure. Um, let me flip forward a few slides. Um, here we go. Um, so the first, I would say, best practice is a little bit of a bigger picture public policy issue that our program involves. Um, as I mentioned, our county, our excuse me, our program is supported by the County of Alameda um, and includes a lot of other service providers. Um, and so this program includes increased county funding for legal services, case management, medical care, coordination and data sharing, and also an increased general assistance, sort of cash assistance amount for clients with SSI cases. Um, the program is funded in part by AB 109 funding, which is a really important source of funding that counties can use um, and ultimately really goes to improve outcomes for reentering individuals as well as other community members with impairments. Every component of the project is really important both to improving success for individuals with their SSI cases um, and also improving clients' well-being throughout the process and in the long term. Uh, again, the legal advocacy, many, many people we encounter have previously attempted to apply for SSI benefits, have been turned down, have gotten discouraged, or have not followed up on appeals. And so legal advocacy can both greatly increase the success of client outcomes, but also increase the amount of benefits that clients get. Case management services really help increase client stability throughout the process. Um, and a lot of the case management providers also can provide some housing support. And then medical and mental health care as well is really important both for clients' well-being um, and also for generating the evidence that we need for a successful SSI case, which is based almost entirely on medical and mental health care. Um, and again, all of these services are especially important for clients in reentry who may not have established support systems in the community or may not have a lot of treatment history. Um, it also leads to significant benefits and cost savings for the county in the long run. Um, the county ends up reducing the amount that they would otherwise spend on cash assistance once clients are approved for SSI benefits. The county can also get reimbursed for GA payments made during the period of the SSI claim. Um, the county also saves money once people are stabilized with income, with housing, with medical care. Um, you know, the county saves a lot of money on emergency medical and mental health care, reincarceration in particular, and other county support services. So a big picture best practice for agencies and providers who may want to be involved in this work is starting to collaborate and advocate with your county around funding and gathering together um, this kind of program. And again, AB 109 funding is a great source for that. Other best practices that are really important in addressing some of the challenges that we face. 
um, is getting into the jail promptly so that we can meet with referrals and clients before they're released. Because often we get referrals for folks who are cycling through or who are released quickly for any number of reasons. Charges are dropped, released on their own recognizance, and so we're not able to catch them before they're released. Um, Having a dedicated space in the jail to meet with clients is really important because it's always a challenge when you're meeting with clients in custody to ensure confidentiality, especially when talking about sensitive legal issues and medical issues. Uh, close collaboration with both jail and community-based service providers, um, both because the jail providers are the ones who are screening and referring and identifying clients for us to meet with, and because they are the source of clients' care while clients remain in custody. And then collaboration with community-based service providers across a wide array of support services uh, gives us the chance to really help connect clients with more comprehensive support when they're transitioning back into the community and throughout our work with them. And finally, just patience. SSI cases on their own can take a long time and you're working through multiple layers of bureaucracy. So just keeping in mind that we're really trying to support our clients through what can otherwise be a frustrating and confusing and disempowering process for them. And the one thing that I noted earlier was just having a pre-release agreement between the jail facility um, or the prison and the local social security administration improves the sort of administrative link linkages when you're trying to su submit applications and continue and develop cases for clients while they're incarcerated. CDCR already has a statewide uh, pre-release agreement with the Social Security Administration, and then individual county jails can set up agreements with the local Social Security office in their county or in their area. So I'll defer um, that. I'm, I'm sorry, can I jump in for a second on okay. uh, the topic of the agreements with Social Security? Of course. So um, what we have heard from various facilities is that whether or not they have a, um, whether or not the individual facility has, uh, for CDCR facilities, whether or not the individual facility has a memorandum of understanding with the Social Security Administration all comes down to whether or not that facility has processed the paperwork, and many of them have not. For example, uh, California Correctional Center does not have an agreement with the Social Security Administration um, that is completed, so there's no uh, way to go through correctional counselors to access those resources or to apply ahead of time. And that's a really that's a really unfortunate thing. And unfortunately, sometimes when you're getting bureaucracies to speak with each other, you run into problems. The Social Security Administration, according to its own rules, is supposed to accept pre-release applications for individuals. But again, it, um, that's the reason that having pre-release legal advocacy and legal advocates who can serve as a go-between and help facilitate clients' applications so that you don't have to rely entirely on jail or prison-based providers, um, or excuse me, jail or prison-based counselors who are often over, overworked, understaffed, um, is really important. And so we are helping clients to navigate that those linkages um, so that they don't have to rely entirely on the facilities themselves. But Emily, thank you for that, for, for highlighting that, because we work with folks right now who are in the county jail. Um, and so most of our clients, once in a while, we have a client who may be transferred to state prison for some period of time. Um, but most of the clients who we are actively working with in custody are in the jail. And so we have the benefit of an existing pre-release application. Um, but that's why trying to ensure that one is established can be really can be an important big picture best practice. Yes, and thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying that for everyone. Um, what we have found in the CCC uh, prison, for example, is um, that even just getting the forms for the pre-release application has been a significant barrier to a lot of the men inside and that uh, the only way that they seem able to effectively get their applications done is by first uh, appointing an authorized representative. So that's kind of how it sh shakes out at that facility, at least without a memorandum of understanding. 
Yeah, and we serve as authorized representatives. That is entirely our role. Um, and that that's, you know, can be really important in general. Um, and then having particularly a legal advocate, but this may be something um, to address more offline as well. Because um, unfortunately, as I said, that it's also one of the challenges of a pre-release services. Yeah, I'm gonna let Holly jump in and talk a little bit about best practices. We're at 1 p.m. right now. Um, well, I think when I mentioned the certificates earlier, that that is, uh, we are well known, our office is well known in LA County. So when they go to court and they see that they took a class given by our office, uh, judges are usually impressed. But it also, it's amazing to see how the women are when they get these certificates. You know, a lot of these women are people who've never had any kind of diploma or certificate in their life. And this means a lot to them, and they're very proud of themselves, as they should be. Um, I do know of one uh, woman who told me that the police came out to her home after she was released about some children that were in the home, and she showed them the certificates, and they kind of gave her another chance. Um, uh, we give a survey at the beginning of each class. It's, a, we, it's anonymous, we don't want their names, we don't grade it for that purpose, with questions about the topic. We give them the exact same survey at, after the class ends, where they now hopefully have had the answers, and we compare to see how they've done, if, they, if we've made a difference. And in addition, they can write on the back anything they think about the class. And I, um, I'm not tooting our horn, but we have gotten very, very good feedback, and we know we have made a difference. And the, the, uh, the students, the inmates, will tell us that before they leave the classroom. These are most of the things we tell them they really did not know. And they did not know, for example, they could get extra time with dependency court, maybe to complete a program. Or they didn't know that they still had rights to see their child. Uh, and it, it's very, very important. And, you know, it, it gives them a good feeling and it gives us a good feeling knowing we've made a difference. Okay, um, Emily, do you have anything to add or should we wrap up or do we want to talk a little bit about overcoming challenges dealing with the prison system? What do people I just think? have a short thing to add, add about the mentorship program. So um, with, with the with the 20 week program that we ran at CCC, we appointed, um, well, we took applications at, during the first lecture from a few interested uh, students who wanted to be leaders in, uh, in their program. And we gave them, uh, for example, a code of conduct, which you know, asked them to be role models for the other students and to help others with their homework and their reentry plans. And this, provide, this was mostly lifers that we found um, opting into this. And they did an excellent job. And afterwards, when they were surveyed, they mentioned that being uh, having that kind of input allowed them to educate others uh, who were not in the program about their legal rights and also gave them a sense of purpose when they're they had so much uh, time to go before their parole eligibility so that that's something that I would uh, qualify as a best practice um, is to kind of uh, cultivate the self-esteem especially of students uh, and provide them with practical tools so that they can feel that they are contributing as well to the betterment of reentry Great. And we have a question from the audience. Um, the question is, what happens if a person gets arrested and sits in jail, maybe for two years, and is finally found innocent of all charges? Do they get their SSI, SSCI case reinstituted with back pay because it wasn't their fault they got arrested when the police arrested the wrong person? So I'll take that one. Um, the rules of what happens with benefits during incarceration are slightly different depending on the program. So for SSI benefits, um, your benefits are suspended if you're incarcerated for 30 days in a, in a row, regardless of conviction. Um, this also applies to other types of institutionalization like long-term hospitalization, for example. Um, unless it's significantly paid for by Medicaid. So for someone who it spends two straight years incarcerated in jail, um, again, sorry, the benefits will terminate if they're incarcerated for 12 months in a row or more, uh, again, regardless of any conviction. 
So if you are incarcerated for more than 12 months, even if you are later, um, even if you're, you're never convicted, for example, uh, your benefits will still end and you will still need to reapply. For SSDI benefits, they're only suspended if you're incarcerated for 30 days in a row after conviction for a crime. So if someone is never convicted, um, then those benefits should not be suspended. And for someone who is convicted, their benefits could be restarted again after release, regardless of how long they're incarcerated. So I hope that that clarifies. But again, if you spend significant amounts of time in jail simply a awaiting trial, um, that in period of incarceration will affect your SSI benefits, but it should not affect your SSDI benefits in the same way. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and actually, um, I just say we have flyers about what happens to benefits and how to restart them. So if anyone is interested in a hand, a simple handout, you're welcome to uh, email me for that or any other resources after the presentation. All right, I think I'm gonna wrap it up. Do uh, you three have anything you'd like to say in closing? Uh, just thank you for this opportunity to, to discuss what goes on um, in the jails and the prisons. Uh, yeah. And yes, I'd, for, like to, I'd like to second that. I, yes, I will third that um, and also say that for anyone in, who has clients in Alameda County who might need assistance, you're welcome to refer them to us. Um, and for for advocates outside of Alameda County, if you're interested in more information about how this countywide project was set up, um, uh, we also have information about sort of the backdrop of what went into putting together our countywide advocacy project. Great, thank you. Thank you uh, I, so much. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'd just uh, like to add one last thing as well. Our reentry legal information hotline is also open to attorneys. So if attorneys have any questions about reentry issues, um, we are happy to answer or to provide research from our team of attorneys. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm going to do a quick final pitch just to let folks know that even if you're funded through Federal Legal Services Corporation, you are allowed to provide services in county jail. You just cannot provide litigation or work challenging the conditions of incarceration. Um, and so that's just to let you know that uh, I believe Bay Area Legal Aid is funded in part through Legal Absolutely. Services Corporation. Yes. And is still able to maintain funding. If anybody has any questions or runs into any issues or wants to start a program like that, please reach out to us. We're happy to talk with you and provide resources and information. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar. Um, if you are an attorney, um, well, everyone will be see, will be receiving MCLA certificates after I review today's in-session times. But because I have a conference coming up, that will likely be next week, sometime in the middle of the week. Um, and thank you again to the presenters for sharing this training with us. It was really great. Um, we hope that you will all check out our next webinar, From Protest to Policy, Transforming a Grassroots Anti-Discrimination Movement into State Law. That will be on Monday, December 4th, and that is also co-sponsored by Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. You can register for, for that by visiting our website, www.lacconline.org, L-A-A-C online.org, and going to upcoming trainings. The Legal Aid Association of California, which is our organization, also known as LAC, is the membership organization for IOLTA-funded nonprofits. Our job is to advocate on behalf of California's legal services community. In addition to our webinar programs, we hold in-person trainings throughout the year, and we would love to meet you all in person. Again, you can find more information about us on our website, lacconline.org, and find more trainings, including in-person ones, on under our trainings tab. Thank you and hope to see you on in future trainings. Bye.